I saw myself as a hobbyist. I had no professional education, no skill sets that were classically trained. I just had a natural gift. And so I never thought I could call myself an artist. But when an unknown judge awarded me Best in Show, from that moment, for the first time in my life, I said, I am an artist. Hello, and welcome to Along the Way Life's Journey. I'm your host, Carl Buccellano. Let's get the next journey started. We have a truly amazing guest today. She's a multimedia artist, speaker, designer, and writer. What you may call a Renaissance woman. Having won numerous awards, frequently awarded first place and best in show, she was honored when selected to the top 100 artists presented in the National Arts in the Parks competition in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Her painting titled Civil War toured selected top museums throughout the U.S. for an entire year and is now in a private collection. Her original painting titled The Good Shepherd has gone global as it was featured centerfold in Billy Graham Decision Magazine. It currently hangs in the Presidential Palace in India. What an honor. Mary Ellen loves fashion and has an online boutique featuring luxury fashion accessories. A very busy lady, yet she is currently building both a new website and a YouTube channel where she will feature all her art and stories, and hopefully co-host with me as well. She is my toughest critic and my biggest fan and the love of my life. Please welcome my wife, Mary Ellen Bucciolano. Hi, Carl. (laughs) So good to have you join me on this show. We've been planning this and talking about this for some time now, and... uh, for those of you who are watching now, it may seem a little uh, that we're in different places, and we are. Mary Ellen's in her studio in our home, and I'm in my studio in our home, both of which she created, the backdrops. So welcome right. to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, you know, patience is a virtue, and God's timing is always perfect. I said in the intro that you're an artist of multi-levels. You, you're, you're a painter. You're a poet. And you make original jewelry, design original jewelry that are beautiful, beautiful things. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, let's talk about your painting, because that's been a a mainstay and a part of who you are for most of your life. When did you first realize that you were a gifted and talented artist? Well, uh, realizing I was gifted and talented uh, probably came later in life, but I knew that I loved to draw when I was very little in early grammar school. And uh, I was just very excited to draw. And there was only one thing I liked to draw when I was a little girl, and that was horses. And I drew them over and over and over again. And um, I came to realize that uh, this was something that it was a gift. And as as the years went on, uh, it was cultivated. So yeah, as a little girl, I loved to draw. So what was your medium when you were a child? What type of work did you do? Was it watercolors or crayons? What did you use? Well, as a child, it was just pencil drawing or coloring books and crayons. I remember just, I can remember, and I bet you, you know, most of the audience listening here today can remember when they were little, they got that brand new box of Crayola crayons. I could just see, and I got the big box with the sharpener on the side, and I can just remember opening up that box of Crayola. You could just smell those fresh new crayons. And I'll tell you, that was very exciting. Every And every Christmas, I'd get a new box. What a happy memory. That's wonderful. So tell us about your first award when you were first recognized as an artist. Well, you know... Art came and went in my life through the years. I enjoyed art in grammar school and did a a couple of courses in high school. But then when I graduated high school, I moved on to New York City and um, art, there was no art in my life. I worked on Madison Avenue and I did some modeling and one thing led to another. But at the age of 30, I didn't have to work outside the home anymore. At that time, I had moved to Florida and I had retired. I'd worked in the beauty business for a number of years. And so I said, you know, if I ever didn't have to work outside the home, I'd love to pursue and see if that talent as a little girl was still there. And so I went and I got myself a set of watercolor paint, uh, paints and papers. And after two weeks of making mud puddles, I threw them away. 
However, I went to an art show and I saw some acrylic canvases that I really liked. And I said, I'm going to try acrylics. So to make a long story short, for two and a half years, I painted with acrylics and I copied everything out of how-to books. And then I switched over to oils for another two and a half years. I copied everything out of how to paint books, like how to paint landscapes, how to paint still lifes, how to paint seascapes. And I just did paintings to decorate my home. And, uh, you know, my friends and family, they all told me, oh, Mary Ellen, you're so talented. But as you know, friends and family will always tell you you're talented. You know, you really quite aren't sure. However, I decided at that time, now I was about 35 years old, that I wanted to try watercolors once again. But this time I got into a class with a teacher. The teacher was excellent. She was a nationally renowned watercolor artist. She was listed in the Who's Who of American Art. And, she, and I took her beginner watercolor class. And uh, when I brought a, a, a painting into the class, she would critique our work, the students. She said, you know, Mary Ellen, if you're going to work from books or pictures, you'll never be able to compete or sell your work. If you want to become a professional artist, you're going to have to, and, you ha and you're an artist who likes to work from photography, you have to become a photographer. You have to take your, your photographs and then copy your own photography. That was a very key yes. insight that she gave yeah. me. And so I did just that. I went home and at the time I loved country and Americana and I was collecting country antique pieces. And so I just set up a couple of uh, antique pieces in the front of the French doors in my home and the sunlight was coming on. I photographed it, I painted it and I brought it into class the next week. And the teacher, when she, as part of the class, she would have everybody one at a time, put their painting up in front of the class and she would critique it. And when my little still life, and I titled it Apple Pie, because it had a bowl of apples and a hurricane lamp. When she came to my painting, she said, who did this? And I raised my hand and she said, I can't critique it because I am a professional artist. And I want you to take this painting and put it in a competition. She said, I believe that you're gonna win a prize with this. Well, I went from that moment being a hobbyist who just decorated my home <laughs> and putting paintings up on my wall and giving it to friends for gifts She's telling me I could compete and win. And I'm like, oh, wow. So, of course, I took that painting to the frame store. I had it professionally framed. I went and she told me about a show up in Palm Beach. I went and entered the show and anybody could get in. And I put my paid my $20 entry fee and I entered the show. And then we told all of our friends to come up to the opening. And I was going to be in an art show opening. Now, they didn't tell you if you won or not. You had to go to the opening and see if there was a ribbon on your painting. Well, myself and family and friends, we all went up and we walked into the gallery and there was my little painting with no ribbon on it. And I was like, my teacher told me I could win a prize. And I was really, you know. It was so, not first <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I go back to class that Monday and I said to the teacher, I said, well, I entered the show, but you had me believing I'd win a prize. She said, well, Mary Ellen, you did a little painting and it was just like a, a 12 by 18. She said, judges usually like a full sheet and a full sheet is 22 by 30. She said, I'll bet you if you did that in a full sheet and entered it in another competition, you'd win. Well, I believed this woman. She knew what she was talking about. So I did just that. I painted the painting again large, put it in a different show with a different judge. And the judges had no way of knowing who the artists were because when your painting went into competition, they covered up your signature with a tape. So, and they brought in a judge from out of town. So it was very, very fair judging. And my painting won best in show. And I will never forget that moment. From that moment, for the first time in my life, I said, I am an artist. How did it feel? It was one of the happiest moments in my life because I saw myself as a hobbyist. I had no professional education, no skill sets that were classically trained. I just had a natural gift. And so I never thought I could call myself an artist. But when an unknown judge awarded me Best in Show, from that moment on, I identified myself as a professional artist. And Fantastic. it changed. Fantastic. So that reminds me of two things. First of all, 
they say for musicians, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Very simple. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. You practice right. for years. You perfected right. your, tra your, your trade and your, your capability, and there it showed. You walked in one day, and you were crestfallen because there was no ribbon. But that's because it wasn't the rules that they told you. And when you, you followed the rules and you did it exactly the way you should have, you walked in to the honor of best in show. Not just a, a, an add-on ribbon, but best in show. That best in show. Delighted. I mean, fantastic. Yeah. What a wonderful feeling. And then you said you, you became a photographer. Now, I know you are a very, very gifted photographer. And it shows not only in your photographs, but in your artwork. Because you understand composition and scope and balance, and you, you really utilize that when you take photographs. And uh, that must have helped you enormously when you went on to craft other, photo, other artworks throughout the years and photographs as well. So is pho photography one of your favorite things these days? I love photography for a lot of reasons. I use it for uh, across the board. I use it as subject matter for my paintings because as a fine artist, when I would paint canvas or watercolor, whatever, I had to set up the scene first with models, photograph it. And then what I did is I used my photograph uh, as a reference for the painting. As a matter of fact, the painting that you see behind me is a painting that I did, and it's called Taking a Break. And it's actually, I dressed my parents in costume <laughs> and set them. And I was a quilt collector at the time. And they came down to Florida and they were visiting me because I'm from New England, from Massachusetts. And I said, I want to do a, a painting with, with the two of you. My father actually uh, got somebody to loan him the overalls. And I had made this <laughs> dress for my mother. And I was a quilt collector. So we strung a line in my backyard in a very luxurious neighborhood on Los Olas, I strung a clothesline and hung the quilt on the clothesline and posed my parents. And uh, from that photograph, I did this painting. So that's my mom and dad as my models. And beautiful it's called picture taking of beautiful people. Beautiful picture. Yes. I'm sure your dad <laughs> felt right at home in those cover rooms. Oh, me, that he was from New England and had a garden and he used to like to work in his garden, but he never had any cover rolls in it. That's right. No, he did it. He never wore them, actually, but he was such a good sport. And uh, that was a very, very happy memory with my parents. And that's, I have this painting to that's commemorate great. that. That's yeah. great. So in keeping with that, you became very prominent in producing artwork in Americana. You were, That was your, your style. You worked on Americana. You created an absolute masterpiece. Tell us about what that is, and then I'll finish what I'm thinking. Go ahead. I found that I love to do a uh, human image and Eric gone by. That was the subject matter that I was passionate about. And as an artist, you know, whatever your create, whatever your genre is, whether you're painting or whether you're an, a culinary artist or a photographer or a jewelry designer, you must love what you're going to create. And I was passionate about American history and Eric gone by and the simple country life. And so at first, I would get people to dress up like I did with my parents and costume them and pose them. But I also discovered that I could travel to living history museums around the country. Being from Massachusetts, there are some fabulous living history museums. There's Old Sturbridge Village. There is Plymouth Plantation, which is the Pilgrims and the, and the Native Americans. And so I would travel up to these living history museums, and I would go on a photo shoot. And I would just shoot the reenactors. And then when I would come back to Florida, I would pick out the pictures that really spoke to me. And those would be the pieces that I would paint. And I, on one occasion, uh, I had traveled to Plymouth Plantation in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And there was a reenactor of a Native American. And when I walked up to him, he was just sitting there in the sunlight. And he was carving and whittling a, a ladle with, with an axe. Because everything was authentic to that period in time. And the sun was shining on him and I, and I saw this scene. And I said, if I can capture this with my camera, what I'm seeing here, this, this young man making this, uh, this ladle, if I can capture this in a great photograph, then I know I can interpret it in a watercolor painting. And so I did just that. And the piece is titled So Beautiful because when I saw this young man Everything was so beautiful about it. And many people who have seen the painting, when they see it, they go, that's so beautiful. <laughs> so that's the I did. Of the painting. When I saw it the first time, I said, that's so beautiful. 
We yeah, had a seat it, in our home, and every time guests come over, they're astounded by it. They just right. It's it, amazing. It's over the, the fireplace in 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 our home. It's, it is probably my finest piece that I feel I've done uh, as far as execution, subject matter, everything is working on that piece. And one of but, the things uh, about that particular piece is it's watercolor, but it ha you've put so much detail in it. It's hard to believe. It's uh, and novice like me, I always think that to get that kind of detail, you need oil or acrylic. You, you did it with watercolor in a massive way. The man is wearing suede chaps and you can almost feel the bristle on the hair on the, on the suede. It's amazing. How long yeah, did it take it, you to do that? When I would start to do a painting, I would just take it all the way through. My days were totally interrupted. I would be in my studio alone, no phones, nobody around. And if I were to start a painting on a Monday morning, I would uh, work on it several hours a day until it was finished. I wouldn't make any plans. I had no social, I would no socialization until I closed up the studio at the end of the day. Because when you're working on highly technical things, you really have to focus. But for some reason on this particular piece, I said, I'm going to start logging in my hours. And so I did this piece. It was over a two week period of time, but it was 40 hours to do so beautiful. 40 hours. Doesn't seem like all that amount of, it means a lot of time, but it doesn't seem like all that amount of time when you consider the masterpiece that was produced. I mean, you would think you. it would take much longer than that. You know, I, I, I love art and every time we go into different cities, I'd love to drag you along to different museums, as you know. <laughs> and I, I, and yeah, I, there were a number of times where, you know, we'd be walking along and I'd say, look at that wonderful thing, as you did with others, friends of ours in San Francisco. You, you tell us how it was done, not who did it, but how it was done. And it's always an amazement to know that you're so skilled at those kinds of things to understand that. It takes more knowledge than just uh, studying the history of, of artwork to understand artwork. You have to understand the, the technique and the, the applications, and you certainly understand that. You're an artist from the, from the word go. There's no doubt about that. But... I want to go back to something. Uh, you worked for a long time in Americana, and you were very talented, very gifted, and got all kinds of accolades and awards, and then you shifted. You shifted your vision, and you began to paint different types of images. Tell us about that. Well, for a number of years, um, I was on to something that was working for me, which was the country life, Aragon by human image. And, you know, I would, did very, very well with that. I had a couple of pieces go national, and and uh, I loved it. But then in my personal life, I kind of had a crossroad. Uh, there was a change in my life, and 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 it was a uh, a personal crossroad. And with that personal crossroad, in it it was a divorce situation. Uh, it also was um, a time to pivot, a time to look at how my life was going and and examine my priorities. And I saw that although my life had been very successful and I had a very beautiful and charmed life as an adult, that as the Bible says, a house that was built on sand when the storms came, it crumbled. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I found myself uh, in a divorce situation and very down and discouraged, uh, even depressed and it wasn't going to be the nice house I had or the jewelry or the nice car or all the art awards that was going to really heal what was broken in me. I knew that I had to get right with my creator and that I had to go back to my faith, which was instilled in me as a child, but find my relationship with my creator now for where I was at that time as an adult. And so I went on a spiritual journey and I actually prayed to the Lord for him to reveal himself to me and help me get my life back on track in this new journey that I was going to go forward as a single woman. And I was blessed to find a really good Bible teaching church. I got involved in a women's Bible study and I found that as I started studying scripture and making friends and I had a whole different scene of friends now and different activities and my focus was different. And as I was allowing God to heal me through the study of the word, through prayer, through changing some bad habits and replacing them with good habits, I found that, wow, you know, as an artist, the things that I wanted to paint uh, were different because I had a three-year hiatus where I didn't paint at all. As I was going through this tough time in my life, 
I didn't paint. There was no uh, creative juices flowing in me. But as I saw uh, God healing my life and giving me new purpose and new vision, I just made a decision that I wanted to use this talent that God had given me, but I wanted to use it to tell his story. And you know, it's funny, Carl, because my passion for painting earlier was historical, human image, era gone by. And now in this new chapter in my life, going forward with my faith first, I wanted to paint the same subject matter, historical, human image, era gone by, but I wanted them to be biblical scenes. And so I offered up a prayer and I said, Lord, if you will show me what to paint to tell your story, then I am going to paint and wherever you want those paintings to go, you open the door and they will go out. And thus started my collection of Christian uh, paintings, biblical paintings. And there are quite a few of them. The, uh, the most significant one, I think, or the most well-renowned one is the shepherd holding the lamb. And uh, that's the story in and of itself. And I'm sure you'll tell that story sometime, but uh, we're, uh, well, it'll take you probably a half hour to do it correctly. So, <laughs> uh, Well, Carl, as you know, I have a website. Uh, yes, when I was going to bring up website that. <laughs> and my YouTube channel. And I have actually made a video of the story of the shepherd painting, which is on my YouTube channel. Right. The, uh, the story of how that painting was inspired and uh, how it was created and what God has done with this painting, taking it all over the world. The whole story is in a video on my YouTube channel. Faith so folks, God. this is a time for me to remind you that you don't have to make notes about that. All of Mary Ellen's contacts will be in the story notes. Just click and go forward. You'll see uh, her website. You'll see some of her videos. If you click onto her YouTube channel, you will see a whole list of other videos that she's created. Very, very talented. Some of them very deep and moving. Some of them humorous and fun-like. And, uh, because that's oh, the yeah, nature like of who she is. She's many facets. I said in the introduction, this is a Renaissance woman. <laughs> uh, this is indeed a Renaissance woman. She's a poet, a designer, a filmmaker now. She's focusing on learning how to create films of all kinds. And it's just been <laughs> great working together because this show that we're on right now is a result of Mary Ellen's influence on me. You see back there behind my shoulder, the book I wrote, To Every Page Attorney. That was a result of Mary Ellen saying, you got all that good stuff, do something with it. So we created a book and the book became a bestseller and I'm supposed to promote it. I told them I'll promote it for two minutes. She just got the two minutes, but I have to promote, I have to promote Mary Ellen because she's the one who created the cover on that book who assisted me in going into some chapters and areas that were very emotionally difficult for me to share, but she encouraged me to do it. And then as a result of that, this podcast came about. And she helped me greatly in creating the podcast because that whole stage behind me there, she created for the use of this, of me sitting here, not knowing what I'm doing, other than press a button here and <laughs> open my mouth and talk because I'm not a pro, but she is. She knows exactly what she's doing. And, you know, I said in the introduction, she's my toughest fan, my toughest critic and my biggest fan. Well, I indeed am her biggest fan. I think she's amazing. And every day we're married almost 15 years. And I always find new facets to that diamond. She's always showing a new creative expression. And she's always showing a new way to look at things and, and kind of turn it around and find some new, new value in it. And I... I I absolutely love you for it. I absolutely. And now we're talking about the possibility of That's she right. joining me as co-host on That's this right. show. So tell us what you think. Give us thumbs up, write and give us comments. Tell us, hey, what do we want with you when you got that beautiful woman instead to sit on the stage? Why don't we want to listen to you? Because there are many stories that we can tell and share. And she, uh, she's an endless pit when it comes to the stories. You know, and Carl, I just want to add... Carl and I are brainstorming right now about doing some videos together. And we, um, we have a basic theme and, and it's going to be he and I just having fun, reminiscing on the good old days, telling funny stories, because, you know, there's a lot of seriousness in the world today, but there's still a lot of joy. And, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And that 
truly, it is true. And Carl and I, Carl, as you know, you know, we have so much fun together when we're sitting having coffee and whatever and reminiscing on stories. We thought it would be fun to bring some of these stories uh, to the viewing audience, Carl and I, and actually it's it, we're calling it C and Me Studios, C for Carl and me for Mary Ellen, C and Me Studios. <laughs> And um, we're brainstorming about that. So if you guys are, are interested in seeing some of these fun things that we're going to do, creative and otherwise, please leave a comment below. Let us know because we want to entertain you. We want to encourage you and uplift you and exhort you. And so let us know what kind of fun things you'd like to see because we're ready to turn the cameras on and have fun with you guys. And one of the fundamentals of this show is we want to be able to inspire and motivate people with stories, other people's stories. We've had many people on this show who are very motivating, but we also have our own stories, Mary Ellen and I. And we hope that uh, when we talk to you about people in our lives who have, were instrumental in motivating us and inspiring us to move on to a different direction or to be challenging us to be more than we were, uh, we hope it reaches you. And we hope that you use that and that you dig into yourself and find equal experiences that you've had and share them with other people. Mary Ellen, I am sure throughout your life, you have met many, many people that have been motivating and, and instrumental in inspiring you, especially on your faith walk. I know that Absolutely. you're a, So would you like to point one out and tell us a story? Oh my gosh. Uh, there's so many people that I could point out. I almost hate to pick one, but um, real quick, a uh, uh, Probably one of my greatest um, motivators and people that have inspired me are my parents. And uh, we'll talk more about them later. I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Uh, you know, I come from a family with six children. My mother was born blind. My mother is was one of eight children. And my grandparents had eight children and six were born blind. My mother was born blind, was blind all her life. She lived to 101 she was one of my greatest sources of inspiration. She, uh, I mean, there wasn't anything she couldn't do within reason. And um, just to, even to this day, when I think of all the examples that my parents set for me, I am really blessed. And I would love to share some of those childhood stories of what it's like growing up with a disabled parent. And um, because my mother, although she had a disability, she never saw herself as the word they used to use back then was handicapped. She never saw herself. She said, I will work around it and I will do what I can do. And what a great example she's been for me in my life. So I'd love to tell more stories about childhood growing up. And uh, we're going to do that. I just want to mention that I only met her briefly because Mary Ellen and I have been married for almost 15 years and she's passed a few years ago, but I, I did meet her a few times and talked to her on the phone many times. And I, I grew to love her enormously. Uh, she was only a little bitty lady, maybe four foot eight, something like yep. that. Maybe four, ten four, four, and 80 four, pounds. 10, 80, four, 10, 80 pounds. In my mind, giant. she was a seven foot giant. Yes, she was I would giant. put her up against anyone. She was fantastic. Oh, I yeah. left her and I still do. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why I love her daughter so much, because I see so much of her, you know. I like to say, I'm going to close with this, I like to say that, you know, God has a bit of a sense of humor, because he took a woman with a visual impairment, my mother, and gave her a daughter with a gift of visual arts. And so God is outside the box all the time. He knows the big picture from beginning to end, the Alpha and the Omega, and the Omega. there's no doubt about it. So, right. folks... Uh, we're going to repeat this again. If you like this kind of a sh uh, combination, Mary Ellen and I, beyond the stories of her artwork and so forth, but the interplay between us, that will be very natural, and I'm sure chemistry will work. <laughs> as, Absolutely. And as, as it always does every day with us. You know, it's all about having uh, fun. And we'll tell some great stories, and uh, we'll, we need your feedback, though. We need to hear from you. Tell us yeah. what you think. Give us a thumbs up. Make comments down below. And I remind you, we come out with a new podcast, a new show every Wednesday morning. So before we leave, there's one thing I want to tell you that I say every day. And I'm going to do this with my wife, which I do every day also. I love you. Tell somebody you love them today. Tell somebody you love them today. God bless. God bless. Thank you for tuning into the show. I hope that it resonated with you. 
It certainly did with me. And I hope it encouraged you to realize the true power of your story. As a reminder, new episodes will be released Wednesday mornings on your favorite podcast apps and also on YouTube as well. Be sure to like, subscribe, and turn your notification button on to ensure that you receive updates on new episode releases. I'm grateful for your reviews and your support. The love is certainly felt. Keep it coming. You can reach out to connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, or stop by my website to everypageofturning.com. All links are clickable in the show notes for quick access. Do you think that you or someone you know may be our most inspiring guest yet? Let's hope so. Click on our contact page and get in touch on my website and share your story. I look forward to reading each one person. My best-selling book, To Every Page of Turning, which was published by Mascot Books, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and many more popular book retailers. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Till next time, remember that every day is a new opportunity to write your new page in your incredible journey. And it is incredible. You're the only one who has it.